Hello to all my friends and colleagues in Frankfurt. I'm sorry that I can't be with you today, and I'm also sorry that I can't deliver this lecture in German, but I hope you will understand my English well enough, and I'm happy to entertain any questions later on. If you would like to contact me, here is my email address. As you've heard from Professor Zander, I've had the privilege of working with him and Dr. Schutt on an exhibition that will open at the Städel later this year. Let us all hope that the world is open again and that I can travel and you can come and see it in person. That would be wonderful. Some of what I will say today is based on research for this exhibition, but I'm also going to give you a more general introduction to how art was made and marketed in the Dutch Republic in the world of the artist Rembrandt van Rijn. There are four parts to this presentation. In the first one, I will give you a little bit of background about the special conditions affecting art in the Dutch Republic. In the second part, I will tell you a bit about the art market itself. In the third part, we will compare two different cities in which art was made and sold, the two cities in which Rembrandt lived, Leiden and Amsterdam, and Mixed in with that conversation will be some information about Rembrandt himself and the ways in which he participated in the art market, both as an artist and also as a collector, an art dealer, and a teacher. These are some research resources in case you'd like to know more about this topic. Many of them are available online and there is of course much more so if you would like to dig deeper into this theme, feel free to email me and I can give you additional suggestions. The material culture of the Dutch Republic was rich in media such as architecture, printmaking, sculpture, porcelain, tapestry, and other kinds of luxury goods as well as painting. But for the purposes of this, presentation, we're going to focus on painting. That said, when we get to Rembrandt, it is important to note that he was also an extraordinary printmaker. We're not going to talk about that aspect of his work in this lecture. The 17th century has often been called the golden age of Netherlandish or Dutch culture. That term is highly contested at present, as I'm sure many of you know because it was not an age of golden happiness for everyone, only really for elite members of society. However, I think we can still call it a golden age of painting because there was an unprecedented flourishing of artists and different kinds of art at all levels of production, something as many as 10 million paintings produced during this period has been estimated. Many of them of course, are lost to us today, but we can still name dozens of artists who worked during this period in the Netherlands and produced works that are still worthy of our attention centuries later. There are several cultural factors I'd like to mention which underlie Dutch society of the 17th century, the Protestant Reformation, the rebellion of the Dutch from the Spanish Empire, the rise of Amsterdam succeeding Antwerp as the capital of commerce in Northern Europe, and the growth of an extraordinary economy, which was fueled by global trade, by advances in manufacturing, and other innovations. As I'm sure you all know, the Netherlands was one cultural unit in the medieval and early, early modern period, comprising what is today the Netherlands and Belgium. These two regions were split apart by the revolt from the Spanish Empire, in which ultimately the northern provinces succeeded in separating themselves, while the southern provinces remained part of the Spanish Empire and remained devoted to Catholic rather than Protestant belief. For the art market, the most important thing that happened as a result of the Protestant Reformation was that Protestants removed all of the altarpieces and sculptures and other beautiful works of art from churches. They believed the churches should be pure spaces where only the word, the Bible, took precedence. So, of course, 
This reduced the market for the production of religious imagery, and it inspired artists in the Netherlands to turn to other kinds of subject matter for secular consumption. Here, for example, you see the interior of a Catholic church in the southern Netherlands, which is today Belgium. Zooming in on this detail, you can see the altarpieces that line each bay of the nave. Here is the interior of a Protestant church in the Netherlands, where monuments to saints have been replaced by a secular monument, the tomb of William the Silent, Prince of Orange and leader of the Dutch Revolt. There are text panels on the walls, but there is no visual imagery apart from the tomb. Here are some dates within the long campaign of the Dutch for freedom from the Spanish Empire. Important are 1585, when Antwerp, which had been held by the rebels, is taken back by the empire. The Twelve Years' Truce in 1609-21, which really enables the North to start to develop economically. And finally, the Peace of Munster in 1648, when the Netherlands becomes an independent country. In this painting from the Stadel from 1590, we can see Dutch ships blockading the mouth of the Scheldt River in Antwerp. This eventually led to a decline of trade for Antwerp and the rise of Amsterdam as the leading commercial center of Northern Europe. Recent research shows that the Antwerp art market recovered quite quickly from the events of the revolt. However, other aspects of trade in the Southern Netherlands did not. Many Protestants were forced to emigrate because of persecution by the Catholic Spanish Empire. Many of them moved to the north, bringing their talents and skills along with them. And this helped to jumpstart the economy of the Dutch Republic. Here is some basic information about the rise of the Dutch Republic, also known as the United Provinces, as an independent country. I'm not going to go over this in detail but it shows you on this map the separation between the south, present-day Belgium and Luxembourg, and the north, present-day Netherlands, as of 1609, which was the beginning of the period of truce between the Dutch rebels and the Spanish Empire. A lot of the wealth and power accrued by the Dutch resulted from shipping and seafaring of all kinds, and this painting by Albert Kaup is a good example of how more and more artists began to depict subject matter that related to people's contemporary experience. The rise of Dutch global trade led to a number of innovations in commerce, including the invention of the stock market. Individual citizens could buy shares in ventures that sent ships to other parts of the world to bring back trade. Many of these material goods made their way to the homes of Dutch citizens. It's important to note that one sad aspect of Dutch global trade was participation in human trafficking, the capture and transportation of Africans to places like Brazil, where they served as enslaved workers on Dutch sugar plantations, as well as Indonesia, where indigenous populations were also enslaved. The Dutch also had encounters with indigenous populations in North America and elsewhere. The particular relationship with Africa has been explored in a recent exhibition at the Rembrandt House called Black in Rembrandt's Time, and I highly recommend the catalog to learn more about this aspect of Dutch global trade. An important aspect of civil and commercial culture in the Dutch Republic was that it was citizens not the church and not the hereditary nobility who controlled most aspects of society. This includes charitable organizations, civic government, and commerce. As a result of all of this, it was urban citizens who became the primary consumers of art, and their tastes and their interests would control the development of the art market. In this section of the presentation, we're going to think about the factors that affected the Dutch art market that made it distinctive and lively in the 17th century. We've already mentioned that it was urban middle class consumers who were the primary tastemakers and purchasers of works of art. We will also mention 
the rise of a variety of secular subject types and the ways in which artists responded to this growing and changing art market. Today, many artists attend university in order to learn to be painters or sculptors or printmakers. As I'm sure many of you know, in the 17th century, artists learned as craftsmen in workshops where they began by doing the basic mechanical activities of the studio, grinding pigments, sanding panels, preparing materials for the master artist from whom they learned by doing. They became conversant with every step in the production process of the works of art they were crafting. They worked their way up from apprentice to journeyman, and some eventually were able to establish their own workshops. In most cities in the Netherlands, there was an artist's guild, similar to a trade association for craftsmen today, which protect, protected local artists from the incursion of imported goods. In other words, it made uh, regulations that artists from other cities were only allowed to sell their work during particular times of year. A very important aspect of the Dutch art market was that much of the work produced was produced what we would call today on spec or for an open market where the artist creates work on his own initiative, not necessarily knowing in advance who the buyer is going to be. This is different from the traditional system where elite consumers would commission specific works for specific purposes. It gives a lot more agency to the artist and it broadens the market to include people who will simply drop into an artist's studio or attend a fair or an auction and purchase something that they like, not something that they have ordered specifically for themselves. And this creates conditions where artists start to respond by developing works of art that can appeal broadly. Art theorists in the 16th and 17th centuries considered history painting to be the supreme achievement of any artist. It required a knowledge of all the aspects of visual imagery from figural action to landscape background, as you can see in this very sophisticated mannerist painting by Joachim Uteval. It also required sophistication very often on the part of the viewer to understand what was going on in the painting based on a pre-existing text, either usually classical mythology or the Bible. This was an achievement for artists. It was something that appealed to well-educated clients, but it was not something that appealed across a broad spectrum of art consumers. Already in the 1560s, we see the rise of an interest in secular contemporary subject matter. This is abetted by the Protestant Reformation and by the increasing interest in purchasing works of art, not for churches, but for home display. In this graph from the Acartico database built at the University of Amsterdam, you can see that both in Flanders and in the north, the production of history painting as a percent of the total art production declines over the course of the 17th century. At the same time, other kinds of subject matter are rising in popularity. 17th century Dutch inventories break down subject categories into very specific types, from merry companies depicting people enjoying themselves in a tavern to still lifes in which luxury goods from around the world might be gathered together. For the sake of convenience, contemporary historians divide these into five basic categories. History painting, which we've already mentioned, portraiture, scenes of everyday life, landscape, and still life. Sometimes the imagery of Dutch artists is difficult to categorize on this simple system. For example, Franz Hals's so-called laughing cavalier might be a portrait. In that case, it is a type of art that it was very well established already in the 17th century and required the participation of the sitter who is willing to pose for that portrait. Therefore, it is another type of work that requires a commission rather than being produced on the open market. On the other hand, it could be a trony. In other words, a generic figure in which the person represented is simply a hired model. 
In that case, it's a very novel subject type that became very popular in the 17th century. The sort of swashbuckling attitude of this character is a little bit more flashy than we might expect for a portrait sitter. And so it seems more likely that it is the more novel category, the trony or character study. Here again, we have an image that's a bit difficult to categorize. Hendrik Overkamp's winter scene is an early example of a landscape depicting contemporary rural imagery in which the figures have no more of a role to play in the subject matter than the buildings and the trees and the frozen terrain around them. At the same time, there are so many figures and we get so involved in their actions that we wonder if this might be described as a genre scene. Either way, it is an image of contemporary life, one that would have been purchased and displayed in a private home with very little in the way of deep symbolism or abstruse subject matter. It's simply something that one could enjoy based on one's own personal experience. In some cases, there is a kind of easy progression from the kinds of themes preferred in history painting to those developed for modern imagery. Rembrandt student Nicholas Moss produced genre scenes in which the tenderness between mother and child seems directly related to Rembrandt's representations of the Holy Family, Mary and baby Jesus, in a similar convention. In the case of still life, artists developed very particular types. We've already seen an example of a beautiful bouquet by Ambrosius Boschart. Here are two tabletop still lives by Peter Klaas. According to the objects in them, they take on different meanings. One suggesting the vanity or fragility of life, the other a simple breakfast meal with salt and herring and bread. You can see that the green rumor or wine glass is the same in both pictures. The artist has simply reused an object in his studio in a different combination, thereby creating a different meaning. These are variations on a theme that one artist can produce endlessly to appeal to consumers who might simply purchase those works from his studio. This graph is the result of recent statistical analysis by a graduate student at the University of Amsterdam, Weishuan Li, and she has shown that production of art of all kinds peaked in the 1640s, 50s, and 60s. This was also the period of the greatest economic prosperity in the Dutch Republic. Her research also reveals how much landscape painting became the dominant subject type for private consumers. This makes sense because landscapes are appealing, they're engaging, they're not difficult to understand, and in some cases they were also quick and easy to produce. Here you see two very different kinds of landscapes. The one on the left by Jan van Goyen depicts Dutch dunes, the one on the right, the mountainous terrain of sunny Italy. Van Goyen's painting could be understood as a kind of Dutch patriotism, representing the simplicity of the local terrain. On the other hand, as Michael Montias and Martin Jan Bach have shown, a painting like this would have been relatively quick to produce, thinly painted with a minimum of colors or pigments required. You can see that most of the sky is taken up with clouds, which reduces the amount of blue you need. Blue was a very expensive pigment, and there isn't much going on here in the way of figural action. So an artist like Van Goyen, who was very talented and had produced dozens of these kinds of compositions, could paint something like this in a day or two. This is what Michael Montius has described as process and product innovation. The artist creates a subject type that is appealing to a broad audience and one that can be produced quickly and easily so that he can make many versions of it to suit and appeal to that broad audience to capture this new market for simple subject types for home consumption. Jan Bott was an artist who traveled to Italy and spent his entire career back in the Netherlands recreating that landscape for viewers in the Netherlands who had either been to Italy themselves or might want to engage in a bit of armchair travel. These are much more elaborate 
works of art requiring, as you can see, lots of blue in the sky, lots of detail in the terrain and in the figural action. They're more expensive and larger than Jan van Hoyen's work. At the same time, here you can see two examples by Bott, very similar variations on a theme. So he doesn't really have to develop an entirely new scenario for each of these. He can simply depend upon formulas that have worked well in the past and therefore produce these works efficiently and with great success to appeal to a variety of buyers who are willing to pay his prices. This brings up another question, which is how were works of art valued or priced in the Dutch art market? From the point of view of pure craftsmanship, factors such as time and materials played a role. So more expensive pigments, more intricate workmanship, a more complex composition, works that took longer to produce or that were larger would obviously be able to be valued at a higher price. Eventually, however, the talent of the artist, what Italian theorists would call valore di stima, the fame and the prominence of the artist factored into the price more and more. So someone like Rembrandt was valued for being Rembrandt as much as he was for the actual workmanship. This is a well-known case of a workshop variant of a painting by Rembrandt. His talented pupil, Hovart Flink, produced his own inventive variation on Rembrandt's original. He didn't have to start from scratch, but he did have the chance to make his own creative editing to the composition. Rembrandt was quite a famous artist at this point. Flink was not. So Rembrandt's painting, although we don't know the original price, would certainly have sold for more than the work based on it by a follower. I'd like to focus now briefly on Leiden and Amsterdam to compare the two because Rembrandt was born in Leiden and began his career there, but in his early 20s, he made the courageous decision to move from his hometown to Amsterdam, which was a much bigger art market. As you can see in the statistics compiled at the University of Amsterdam in 1631, which is the year that Rembrandt began to make his move towards Amsterdam. There were only 35 painters active in Leiden while there were 176 in Amsterdam. Leiden was at that time a city about one third the size of Amsterdam, but still those statistics are quite striking. The factors that distinguish Leiden as a community are the university, which was founded in 1585, one of the oldest in the world, and the textile trade, textile manufacturing and trade were a large component of the Leiden economy. Textile production brought to the city an influx of workers, but they were mostly low wage workers who participated in manufacturing. So the community of wealthy art buyers was relatively small. And so too, as we've just seen, was the community of artists. Equally important, there was no St. Luke's Guild to support the artists of Leiden. So there were many works of art brought into the city from elsewhere, particularly from the city of Harlem, which was right nearby and had a very lively artistic community. These factors may have been among the reasons that Rembrandt and several of his talented contemporaries in Leiden decided to leave there in the early 1630s and try their fortune somewhere else. One of the more bizarre products of the Leiden art market was the work of Jakob von Swanenberg, the oldest son of Isaac Klaas von Swanenberg. Jakob was Rembrandt's first teacher, although it's hard to see what Rembrandt might have learned from him. He spent many years in Italy and spent most of his career painting scenes like this one, depicting bizarre imagery of hell and damnation, inspired in some ways by the work of Hieronymus Bosch. Rembrandt's family was deeply embedded in the artisanal culture of Leiden. His parents owned several mills that ground grain, which was used in beer brewing. His siblings belonged to the artisanal class. They either followed the family business or became uh, professions such as shoemaker or baker. 
Rembrandt, in the meantime, attended the university for two years, which probably means that originally he didn't intend to be an artist. He came to his vocation relatively late in life. Vanitas still life was particularly popular in Leiden, also still lives involving books and other accoutrements of the intellectual life. Here you see both a book and a celestial globe, as well as musical instruments. This kind of imagery possibly appealed to a particular market in Leiden, which was the community of intellectuals in and surrounding the university. This dune landscape, which we spoke about a minute ago, was actually painted in Leiden by Jan van Gooyen. He was another contemporary of Rembrandt, but like Rembrandt in the early 1630s, he left Leiden and moved to Hague. Jan Lievens was the same age as Rembrandt, a friend, a rival, possibly even a studio mate, also trained in the same tradition of figural and history painting. Like Rembrandt, he produced single figure paintings as well as historical compositions in his early years. Like Rembrandt too, he left Leiden in 1632, he went to London, then to Antwerp, and eventually to Amsterdam. We'll say more about Rembrandt shortly, but this painting is an example of his early historical compositions painted while still in Leiden. You can see that there is a kind of textural working of the paint, really quite remarkable in terms of technique, but also extremely meticulous and fine in its details. This leads to uh, the inspiration of Rembrandt on one of his first talented pupils, Gerrit Dow, who takes over the market for painting in Leiden after Rembrandt departs. Gerrit Dow went on to found a dynasty of painters, succeeded by his own pupil Franz van Mieris and several generations of the van Mieris family, who made Leiden a center for painting of genre subjects in a particularly meticulous style. He got his start with Rembrandt doing history paintings, but like Nicholas Maas, he took the skills that he learned and transferred them to scenes of contemporary life. The fact that Dow was able to dominate the market in Leiden to establish a particular style for which that city became known is typical of some of the smaller artistic communities in the Netherlands, where one dominant style or artist becomes synonymous with that place. Amsterdam was quite different from that in that it was a much bigger city with a much more diverse art market. So when we come to Amsterdam, we're not talking about a handful of talented painters who got their start there and then moved elsewhere, quite the reverse. We're talking about an enormous city to which artists were flocking from all over the Dutch Republic and even outside the Dutch Republic to take advantage of the largest art market in Northern Europe. Amsterdam was a center of political power. It was the focal point of global trade with its large harbor and active shipping community. It was a place where works of art at all different price levels in a huge variety of subject types were being produced to appeal both to elite patrons and to a growing open market. I'm sure many of you have been to Amsterdam. Here is a tourist view of the Dom Square as it still looks today, dominated by what is now the Royal Palace on the left, but was built in the middle of the 17th century as the town hall and next to it, the so-called new church it's only called new because it was newer than the other medieval church in the city, already hundreds of years old by the time the town hall was constructed. It's now an exhibition space, and the town hall is now the one of the official residences of the king and queen of the Netherlands. So their functions have changed, but their central role in the architecture of the city remains the same. The town hall, which is now the royal palace, was constructed during the years of Rembrandt's maturity in the city of Amsterdam. You can see in this painting by Johannes Lingelbach, who was actually born in Frankfurt, the building under construction and beside it, the Dom Square teeming with people just as it does today, except of course, uh, during COVID times. If you zoom in on this work, you can see that there are people 
dressed in costumes from all over the world, who are, and on the right-hand side, what is now the Damrak, a paved street, is actually a canal where ships are bringing goods from around the world to the Wayhouse, which stands in the middle of the plaza. That building is no longer present. This celebrates Amsterdam as the center of commerce and prosperity for all of the Netherlands at the time. And it was because of this prosperity that it was able to be the richest and most diverse art market of Northern Europe. As mentioned earlier, it was citizens who controlled the most important aspects of urban life, who directed charitable institutions like the Lepers Asylum. And here you see women who were able to serve as regents of this organization. In a few years here in Frankfurt, hopefully you will also see an exhibition about these group portraits, which Professor Zonder is busy organizing. This is a constellation of four paintings that I'm very glad we will bring together in our exhibition in Frankfurt and Ottawa. And it celebrates the patronage of women who commissioned portraits from leading artists in the city, each woman choosing her own particular costume accessories and pose, subtly different from each other, but all at the height of fashion for the time, and all painted brilliantly. There were many talented portrait painters, history painters, landscape painters. Rembrandt arrived in the midst of a lively community to which he contributed, but in which he was not by any means the only gifted artist. Here we see a family portrait from later in the 17th century, and it gives you an example of the wealth and material luxury with which merchant families were able to surround themselves. You see a large painting on the back wall. You also see a sculpture. You see Chinese porcelain or perhaps Delft porcelain on the mantelpiece, a textile or a Persian carpet on the table, a gilded mirror, beautifully dressed family in a palatial family home. This is the height of wealth made possible by mercantile endeavors, investments, personal achievements, not by hereditary aristocratic wealth. So this is a new kind of community in which middle class patronage and taste is the dominant artistic factor. Also significant is the depth of this market for art in Amsterdam and to some extent elsewhere in the Dutch Republic. Peter Mundy, who visited the Netherlands around 1640, was amazed at the fact that he saw paintings everywhere he went, even in butchers and baker shops, even in the homes of modest people. Everyone was collecting paintings, he said. And in this painting by Breglenkamp, you see a landscape on the back wall of a tailor's shop. Perhaps he has it there in order to resell it and make a little bit of a profit on the side. But the point is that there wasn't only an elite market for art in Amsterdam, but products of all different price ranges and types. At the top of the market for history painting, when Rembrandt first arrived in Amsterdam, was Peter Lastman, who had traveled to Italy and studied the monuments of ancient Rome. He came back and wove this knowledge into his brilliant recreations of the Greco-Roman past, as well as biblical subjects. He was the most talented and influential history painter in early 17th century Amsterdam, but he was one of many artists working in this subject category. Krombat van Troyen is the kind of artist who would never make it into a standard textbook, but he was one of dozens of history painters producing work for dealers who kept them on retainer to turn out variations on familiar stories, which were sold for amazingly cheap prices. And the Dutch art historian Angela Yacher has just published a book about this market, which shows you the depth and variety of what was available in Amsterdam in the 17th century. So we tend to focus on elite painters like Lassman or Rembrandt, but it's important to remember that there were many others as well. We can't recount the entire biography of Rembrandt here. We want to focus on the ways in which he was active in the art market 
in Leiden and then in Amsterdam. Key points are that he began his career relatively late in life after attending university. He studied with Svanenborg and Lastman. Then he got a commission to paint a portrait in Amsterdam under the management of Hendrik Allenberg, who was a dealer and painter in the city. From that point, he set his sights on moving to Amsterdam, the bigger market, the bigger challenge, something that could match his ambitions and talents. He was also a diverse and diversely talented artist. He produced work in a wide variety of subjects and media, painting, printmaking, draftsmanship. He was also an extremely prolific teacher. He was an art dealer. He was an art collector. In all of these ways, he participated in the market for art. Rembrandt's earliest known paintings are actually sort of allegorical genre scenes depicting the five senses. These are four of them. The fifth one is missing. They're not what we would expect from an artist who apparently set his sights on being a history painter. So I personally think there's more to his ambitions right from the start than history painting. I think he already was breaking down boundaries between subject categories and trying his hand at all kinds of images that fundamentally have to do with the expression of human experience and emotion. Rembrandt completed this history painting while he was still a young artist in Leiden. There have been about 12 or 14 interpretations of the subject. No one can quite figure out what it was he was trying to say with this painting, but he was clearly inspired by the figural and architectural motifs of Peter Lastman, with whom he spent six months in about 1625. This was his first taste of Amsterdam. It introduced him to the bigger city and its potential. And a few years later, he decided to make the move to Amsterdam himself. As mentioned earlier, Jan Lievens was Rembrandt's friend and rival in Leiden. He had also studied with Peter Lastman. He got his start ahead of Rembrandt because he did not go to university. And this painting by Lievens long ago when I was a grad student was once considered to be the work of Rembrandt. They were close together in style and in substance. But as Constantine Hauchens, one of their early supporters, pointed out, Lievens was a bit grander and more daring in his early work, whereas Rembrandt was more meticulous. Hawkins was the secretary to Stadtholder Frederick Hendrik, the governor of the Netherlands. He was one of the first to take up the cause of promoting Rembrandt and Lievens in the art world. He wrote about them comparing the two and describing them as a talented duo. He could really see differences in both of them, but also potential in both of them. And right away, he touched on Rembrandt's facility for depicting emotion. Hawkins was responsible for securing for Rembrandt a commission from the Stadtholder to paint a series of images of the Passion of Christ. With this commission and a few other activities around 1630, Rembrandt seems to have made a play to become a court artist at The Hague, the court of the Stadtholder. He was not ultimately successful in developing this line of work enough to make a career out of it. He chose instead to go to Amsterdam, where urban middle class patrons seem to have been more satisfied with the earthy, naturalistic approach that he brought to his representations of both portraits and historical compositions. And one good example of that earthy, naturalistic approach is simply to compare his treatment of the body of Christ in that descent from the cross with that depicted by Rubens. Rembrandt knew Rubens's version from a print by Lucas Forstermann. He made his own print after his painting of the descent from the cross. You can see the broken and beaten body of Jesus that Rembrandt makes for a Protestant audience compared with the heroic muscular figure that Rubens created in a counter-reformation Catholic context. These are two very different ways of conceiving this very important historical figure. Rembrandt is staking a claim for lifelike naturalism. It is 
like the representation of emotion, one of the key features of his work throughout his career. This mythological painting was owned by an Amsterdam merchant, Jacques Spex, who made a fortune in the Dutch East India Company, which engaged in global trade. And you can see in the background cranes and ships that might even allude to Spex's activities in shipping and commerce. In the foreground, you see the famous story of Europa abducted by Jupiter in the form of a bull. But in the next couple of slides, we will look at details which depict the lifelike and unidealized way in which Rembrandt represents this scene, which in the hands of Italian Renaissance artists like Titian had been something grand and monumental. Rembrandt's first break, what really put him on the map for the first time in the Amsterdam art market, was this group portrait of the Surgeons Guild under the direction of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. This was a public commission rather than a work for the open market made to celebrate this particular group of individuals and to hang in their guild hall, where incidentally, the Artists Guild was also housed. People could come to see this painting and it became a renowned example of Rembrandt's ability to endow even something like a group portrait with dynamism, energy, and emotion. Rather than a group of heads all lined up in a row, he turns it into an action scene in which the surgeons are watching with rapt attention as Tulp dissects the corpse of a criminal who's been executed and subjected to dissection as a further form of punishment for his crime. This location shot at the Rijksmuseum gives you a sense of the scale of these two grand portraits produced by Rembrandt after he had settled in Amsterdam. These young people were wealthy members of the urban elite. They made their fortune in international trade, including uh, importing sugar from Brazil, and they commissioned Rembrandt to portray them shortly after their marriage in the height of fashion and in the largest, most expensive format one could order as a portrait patron. The same young couple purchased this history painting from Rembrandt, which is an example of how the market for one type of work, that is to say portraits, could lead to others. When portrait clients visited the workshop, they might see other paintings that appealed to them. 1634 was an important year for Rembrandt. He joined the St. Luke's Guild in Amsterdam, set himself up in his first independent workshop as an independent master, and married Saskia von Allenberg, the niece of his business partner, Hendrik Allenberg. This is Rembrandt's funeral medallion, which marked his membership in the guild. And on the left, you see a portrait of himself and Saskia playing the role of the prodigal son in the tavern consorting with a woman of low repute. Why Saskia would want to play that role is hard to imagine as a respectable wife of a prominent artist, but women often served as models for their artist husbands. Of course, we have to mention this masterpiece in the collection of the Stadel, which Rembrandt produced when he was rising to the height of his fame in Amsterdam. He was a celebrated portraitist in the mid 1630s, but he wanted to continue to stake his claim as a history painter. This work is practically incomparable, both in his own achievements and those of his contemporaries. It was not a commercial success, evidently. He did not have an original patron in mind, as far as we know. He offered it to Constantine Huygens, who evidently turned it down. Who its original owner was, we don't know, which is really quite remarkable for a painting of this scale and significance. This painting, on the other hand, shows Rembrandt attempting 
a completely different subject type, still life. There are a few references in documents to still lifes by Rembrandt. This is the only one we know that still exists. It belonged to an Amsterdam family in the 17th century. Their son, Tobias van Domselaar, was a poet who wrote several verses in praise of Rembrandt. From the late 1630s into the middle of the 1650s, Rembrandt was also interested in landscape. This is one of his most beautiful landscape paintings, now in the Rijksmuseum. This shows us that he was not an artist who specialized in one particular subject type, as so many of his contemporaries did. Instead, he tried his hand at a variety of things and excelled at them all. Landscape, like history painting and figure painting, was also taken up by other members of Rembrandt's workshop. So you see that his diversity is absorbed by his students, thereby expanding and extending the reach of his brand in the Amsterdam market. Rembrandt's achievements as a portraitist in Amsterdam culminated in the painting now called The Night Watch, depicting the company of Captain Franz Bunning Cook marching forward, perhaps to participate in some kind of parade or ceremonial occasion. They're mustering together in front of one of the city gates of Amsterdam. This is one of a number of civic guard companies which were composed of volunteer citizens. Often the officers were the most prominent members of their community in their neighborhood. It was an opportunity for male bonding, for civic pride, for civic responsibility. And Rembrandt, as he did with the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp, turns this group portrait into a lively action scene. As you probably know, this painting is currently being intensively studied at the Rijksmuseum, and you can go on their website to see where the progress of that project has gotten to. In 1639, Rembrandt was reaching the peak of his career in Amsterdam. He purchased a grand house for himself and Saskia, in which he also maintained his workshop with dozens of young artists coming to study there. This is now the Rembrandt House Museum, and it has been recreated to give an impression of the way it would have looked when he lived there. This is the front room in which you can see paintings by Peter Lassmann and other artists on display. Rembrandt maintained not only his own workshop in this house, but also an art dealership. And in this room were displayed paintings for sale by himself, by his associates, and by others in whom he had invested. So this is another way in which he was participating in the Amsterdam art market. Rembrandt was also an avid collector of art and natural objects, antiquities, weapons, fabrics, all kinds of things, some of which inspired his art, some of which he must have kept purely for his own curiosity. In 1656, he went bankrupt, possibly in part because of having spent too much money on building these collections. And the inventory record of his bankruptcy is a treasure trove of information about what he owned. The Rembrandt House has used this in part to reconstruct the room in his house where those collections would have been housed, available to Rembrandt and possibly also to his students as sources of study and inspiration. Rembrandt was an avid collector of prints, and we can see a number of cases where works from his own collection must have served as inspiration for his own work. In this case, Durer's famous woodcut from his Life of the Virgin series, depicting Mary and Elizabeth in the moment called the Visitation, seems to have led directly to Rembrandt's painting of the same subject. In other cases, he seems to have deliberately gone against tradition. The abduction of Ganymede, as depicted by Michelangelo and others, was typically an opportunity to represent a beautiful, youthful male figure. Rembrandt turns Ganymede, who was carried up to heaven by the eagle of Zeus, into a pissing, unhappy baby. It is possible that this was a commission to commemorate the death of an actual infant, but it is also a way in which Rembrandt seems to be poking fun at the classical tradition. Rembrandt acquired some of the objects in his collection by attending auction sales in Amsterdam. The records of these auctions, of which there were dozens, provide a picture of the international market for art that took place in Amsterdam. This is something to remember. 
collectors could choose not only the work of local artists, but also old master paintings like those by Raphael and Titian that were brought to the city by collectors who had lived abroad. In 1639, Rembrandt attended the sale of the merchant Lucas van Ufelen, where he saw and sketched the famous portrait by Raphael of the courtier Baldessare Castiglione. What's significant for us in this context are the notes that Rembrandt made on his drawing. He identifies the artist and the sitter, but he also notes that the painting sold for 3,500 guilders and that the entire sale brought almost 60,000 guilders. This was a tremendous amount for the time. Rembrandt's own portraits in this format would have sold for maybe three or 400 guilders at most. So he was probably astonished that an old work of art like this could bring so much more than his own work was bringing. And he set himself to rival Raphael in a number of works that he produced later on. Raphael's painting was purchased by a man who also owned this portrait by Titian. Rembrandt must have seen them both. And he decided to respond by etching a portrait of himself wearing 16th century dress, as if to say that he is the rival of all of these great figures from the past, that he is an artist for the ages, not just someone whose relevance is local and contemporary. He also painted a portrait in this format of himself, which led to numerous self-portraits by other artists later on, beginning with two of his most important students, Robert Flink and Ferdinand Ball. And the next part of the story of Rembrandt and the art market has to do with the growth of these artists as talents in their own right, who develop from students to rivals. We don't really have time here to go into the various artists who worked with Rembrandt, but there were lots of them. They came from cities all over the Netherlands and also several of them from Germany. They came often after having done their basic training somewhere else and wanted to learn Rembrandt's particular skills and techniques. Ferdinand Ball and Robert Flink were the subject of a joint exhibition a few years ago, and you can read about them in the exhibition catalog and in the separate book of essays published to accompany it. Already in 1644, he seems to have been feeling some of this pressure, resisting the critique of connoisseurs who were not particularly impressed with his achievements. And he responds to that with this extraordinary drawing in which you see a critic seated on the left, wearing a hat with the ears of an ass, pointing with his pipe at a half-length figure similar to the kind that Rembrandt and his workshop frequently produced. You can see other connoisseurs in the background posturing in front of a work of art that they are shrewdly examining. But you can also see in the lower right corner the artist expressing his response to this critique by defecating on the floor. In 1642, while Rembrandt was working on the Night Watch, Saskia passed away. So he had the greatest culmination of success in his career and also the greatest tragedy all in one year. After this, his art seems to take a more inward turn. He's concerned with inward emotions, with quiet, somber subject matter. And this manifests itself in a new restraint in his history paintings as well as in his portraits. It was in the late 1640s that Rembrandt came into contact with Jan Six who was one of his great patrons at the latter decades of his life until about the mid 1650s. Rembrandt painted this extraordinary portrait of Six, which is still in the family collection in a way that really demonstrates the breadth and expressiveness of his late style. And you can see that in the detail of the gloves on the left hand side. It's really quite telling that Six's own wife, Margareta Tulp, who incidentally was the daughter of Nicholas Tulp in the anatomy lesson, chose not Rembrandt to paint her portrait, but his former student, Robert Flink. And she chose a much more elegant and stately, 
and lavish form of self-representation, which was inspired in part by the work of the Flemish portraitist Anthony van Dyck. Margarete Tulp was not alone among patrons of her generation in preferring this more elegant style. So it's at this point that Rembrandt's work really starts to diverge from what was the most commercially successful on the art market and become a specific performance of personal style that appeals to a select group of clients who are still willing to appreciate what he has to offer. The epitome of the elegant, new, grand manner of portraiture completely outside Rembrandt's orbit is the work of Bartholomeus van der Helst. He was a specialist in portraiture, something like 95% of all the works we know by him were portraits. And if we look at a detail of this work compared with Rembrandt's Jan VI, you can see how very different their styles were. Young patrons who had inherited their wealth, who were coming to absorb some of the trappings of aristocratic life, preferred to be presented in this slick and polished manner. And it was not something Rembrandt was willing to participate in, although some of his students, like Robert Flink, did. Rembrandt and Saskia had four children, but only one survived adulthood. Titus grew up to become an artist, although not a very good one, and he became an agent and participant in his father's workshop. In 1656, when Rembrandt went bankrupt, Titus was a teenager, and he and Rembrandt's late life partner, Hendrikje Stoffels, formed a corporation and employed Rembrandt, thereby enabling him to carry on working in spite of the fact that he had gone bankrupt. So they were participants in the market on his behalf, as well as family members. Hendrikia joined Rembrandt's household as a servant when Titus was very young and quickly became his lover and his partner for the rest of her life. She was the model for a number of paintings by Rembrandt and his associates. The one on the left here is actually in our own little museum here in Kingston, Ontario, attributed to a quite lesser known student, Jacobus Levesque. The other two are by Rembrandt himself, including the one here in Frankfurt in the Stadel, which you see on the right. The fact that Hendrikia might pose not only for Rembrandt, but also for others in his workshop shows another way in which she served as an active participant in his business. As mentioned earlier, the Amsterdam Town Hall, now the Royal Palace, was constructed in the 1650s. Inside and outside the building were sculptures and paintings that celebrated the prosperity and power of the city. These were plum public commissions that went to a variety of artists, but only one painting was awarded to Rembrandt himself. Inside the building were monumental mantelpiece paintings that depicted scenes from ancient history that were supposed to inspire good behavior on the part of the burgomasters who ran the city. These were awarded to artists, including Ferdinand Ball and Robert Flink, but not to Rembrandt. Here you see the burgomaster's chamber with an overmantel by Ferdinand Ball, and you can see citizens proudly taking in the sights of this grand building. The classical decoration inside the town hall was accomplished by Flemish sculptors and a consortium of Dutch and Flemish painters. An enormous series of lunettes depicting the revolt of the ancient Batavians from Rome, which was seen as a parallel to the more recent revolt from Spain, was commissioned from Flink, but he died before it could be finished. The commission was then divided up and quickly finished by a variety of other artists Rembrandt was given one assignment in the series. This is a reconstruction of how his painting might have looked based on a drawing, because the painting itself still exists only in fragmentary form. The National Museum in Stockholm loaned the fragment of Rembrandt's 
conspiracy of the Batavians to the Rijksmuseum for a while, a few years ago, while the National Museum was under construction. And here you see the kings and queens of the two countries gathered in front of the painting. I show you this just to give you a sense of the enormous scale of this work, even in fragmentary condition. It is likely that the cutting down of the painting took place in the studio of Rembrandt himself, because it was rejected by the city fathers. Shortly after it was installed, they asked him to take it down again. Who purchased it after that, we do not know, but clearly in order to sell it, Rembrandt had to make it into something more manageable. So he focused in on the central figures. When you see a detail of this work, you will see the rough style in which it's painted, clearly different from the polished technique that had come to be favored. When Rembrandt's Claudius Civilis was removed, it was replaced by a hastily worked up painting completed by Flink's pupil, Jürgen Ovens, who incidentally had come from Germany to Amsterdam to study with Flink and to learn also from Rembrandt. Why this was preferred to Rembrandt's painting remains a mystery. Rembrandt made numerous self-portraits over the course of his life. This one shows him as he looked right around the time of the Claudius Civilis Commission. He depicts himself as the Apostle Paul, who was greatly admired by Protestants, perhaps as a gesture of personal faith or simply out of interest in recreating a figure from the past. He was always fascinated by old age, and now he gets to turn that fascination on his own face. But maybe Rembrandt's last painting, found on his easel at the time of his death, reprises a subject that he had treated early in his career. When you look at these two paintings of Simeon with the Christ child, you can see the remarkable evolution of his style from lofty spaces and precise details to an absolute focus on figures engaged in pure emotional response to a profound event and from surface details to rough scumbled brushwork. In making this transition, Rembrandt went against the grain of prevailing taste. For that reason, he's admired today for his artistic independence, but from the point of view of the art market, he did not do himself any favors with this fierce independence. One could argue that students like Flink and Ball surpassed Rembrandt in commercial success in their own lifetimes that they rejected him and moved in a new direction. But I like to think that in fact, his impact was expanded and extended through their work and that his brand as a whole encompasses the achievements of his students, not just his own work. Rembrandt's impact on subsequent generations of artists could be traced in fact, right down to the present day his very last pupil, Art Helder, clearly absorbed his late style and brought it with him back home to his native Dordrecht, where he worked into the 18th century. I'm sure many of you know de Helder's self-portrait in the Stadel, where he picks up on a work by Rembrandt. Both artists portray themselves as the ancient painter Zeuxis who laughed so hard at the ugliness of an elderly female model that he had a heart attack and died. In a way, this strange and humorous subject seems once again to be poking fun at the art market and its obsession with beauty. Rembrandt and de Helder were able to incorporate not only beauty, but ugliness, or one might say to turn ugliness into beauty through their remarkable painterly techniques. We could have a whole different lecture on Rembrandt's impact on the art market today. His work continues to bring astounding prices, much higher than those of his students, although their work also, because of his impact perhaps, continues to grow in value. This little painting, no bigger than a laptop computer, will be offered for sale at Sotheby's 
next week with an estimate of 20 to 30 million dollars. Part of its value lies in its astonishing provenance, going all the way back to Amsterdam in the 1640s. It was owned not only by an Amsterdam merchant, but later by Rembrandt's student Ferdinand Boll, by his major patron Jan Six, by the 18th century collectors Jan Peter Sommer, and the painter Benjamin West, among others. It will be interesting to see what the price of this work will be, and you can find information about it on the Sotheby's website.